going to talk about Node. Uh, so briefly, uh, so Node is, is uh, a server-side JS platform. Uh, it's built on Google's V8. Um, it does it, I.O. in a very special way, which I will describe in great detail. Um, it uses the common JS module system, and uh, it's written in C, which has confused a lot of people. So it's a rather large C project, actually. So the thesis is that um, I.O. has to be done differently. Um, we're doing it wrong. Everything, the way that we're thinking about doing I.O. really uh, makes things difficult. So writing servers and writing any sort of application is difficult because of how we're doing I.O. So uh, a lot of web applications have such line of code, like you query a database, and then you return a result, and then you use the result. And so uh, the question is, what is your web framework doing while, the, while this line of code is running? So uh, in many cases, you're not doing anything at all. You're just sitting there while the database is waiting to respond. And that might be uh, that uh, the uh, database is in San Francisco, or uh, it might be, <laughs> thank you. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, okay. Well, the point is, is that you can't just wait for it to respond. Uh, there's a big difference between what happens inside your CPU, inside your memory, and what happens when you go to something outside of that. If you go to a disk, or if you go to a network, if you have to do a TCP connection to a different server, even if it's in your same uh, hosting center, then you're talking about millions of clock cycles instead of hundreds of clock cycles or tens of clock cycles. So you can't do nothing. So obviously, better software can do better than just wait for the database to respond. It can uh, multitask. So you can have different threads of execution running. Um, so the question is, is that the best that we can do? Um, and I think you can look at uh, two popular web servers and see how they're doing I.O. and decide if what, what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. So here's a benchmark, which uh, is possibly not visible to you. <laughs> but um, it shows uh, concurrency, uh, like the number of concurrent clients on the web server on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, it shows requests per second. And so this is Nginx and Apache. And uh, what you see is that the, the Nginx is, is responding faster. Not so much faster, twice as fast, three times as fast, especially when you get to higher concurrency. Who cares? Um, but the big difference is when you look at um, <laughs> versus memory. So, Again, on the horizontal axis is, is uh, the number of clients on your server. But now on the vertical axis, you have memory. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will draw it for you. This is Apache, and this is Nginx. So. <laughs> it looks great on mine. Uh, Okay, so, so the point is, is that Apache uses tons of memory. When you start getting a lot of clients, if you have 3,000 people uh, uh, connecting to your Apache server, you're using many megabytes of memory. Whereas Nginx stays very stable, it stays with a small footprint. And 
the question really is, what's the difference between these two? And the big difference is that Apache uses threads for each connection, and Nginx uses an event loop. OK. So uh, to be slightly technical, uh, the first benchmark kind of tells you that context switching between the different threads, which is what Apache does, is, is not free. It costs some CPU time. And the second one is that each thread takes memory. And that ends up being a lot of memory. And kind of in the building tight little server thing uh, community, if you want to make a little uh, Nginx server or you want to make a little IRC server, Everybody knows that you can't use threads for connections. This is not the right way to do concurrency. The right way to do concurrency is to have a single thread and have an event loop. So you do something, and then you're done with it. And then you do something else, and you're done with it. What that requires, though, is that what you do never takes very long. You have to have non-blocking I.O. So, uh, Apache uses uh, OS threads. Um, there's other threading systems. You could have green threads, or you could have coroutines. These can help the situation very much, but it's still machinery. It's still something that needs to be done. You have to, you have to do something to, to create the illusion that when you connect to the database, your program halts. You don't move on to the next line until it comes back. It's an illusion. Your program's not halting. It's doing all these other things. But it looks like it's halted. So uh, I say that threaded concurrency is a leaky abstraction. It's, it creates pains. You have locking problems. You can you have these memory problems. It's hard to think about. It's not a very good abstraction for what's really happening on your computer. So code like this, where you call a function, and it connects to some server and returns something from that server as if no time has passed, and then you're going to use the result beyond that. This somehow either requires blocking the entire process, or you're going to have to have some sort of threading system. Maybe it's coroutines, but it's probably going to require multiple uh, execution stacks. But you could have the code like this, where you make the query to the database, and instead of waiting for the response inside that function, you give it a callback in one form or another. Um, when this happens, you can, your execution can, can run right through that statement, make that request, and continue doing other things. When the request comes back, millions and millions of clock cycles later, you can execute the callback. There's no machinery involved in this. All you need is a pointer to that callback. So this is how we need to do I.O. If you want very fast, high concurrency servers, you have to design them like this. <clears throat> so, OK, you say, yeah, but everybody's talking about threads. You know, my boss says that Java threads are super cool, blah, blah, blah. Why isn't everybody doing this? Why should you believe me? Um, well, there's, there's two reasons. Uh, I think they can be summed up in two reasons anyway. Um, and it, it would be cultural and infrastructural. So um, <clears throat> I think that there's a, a cultural bias against doing non-blocking I.O. You know, your first program that you ever do I.O. with is something where you enter your name, and then you get the result. Somebody types that in, but you block on that function. You don't do anything else. And then you print out the name. So we're taught to, like, demand input. And we kind of treat it the same way on, on sockets. So we connect to the database and 
All right, give me the give me the give me the response. So people see code like this, where instead of waiting, you just give a callback, and they say, "I can't do that. That's that's spaghetti code. That's too complicated." I think we should reconsider this. I don't think it is necessarily more complicated. Maybe in the simplest cases like this, but when you start writing an IRC server, it becomes very natural to write code like this. And the other reason would be uh, the missing infrastructure. So remember, if you're on an event loop, you can never block on IO. You can never wait for the database to respond because you're in a single thread. If you ever wait, everything else shuts down. Where in a threaded environment, you can wait occasionally or for very long periods of time. So uh, the problem is, is that we just don't have like, libraries available to us to do this sort of non-blocking I.O. So uh, just a couple of examples, like POSIX has an asynchronous file I.O. specification, but it's really hard to find such libraries. Uh, man pages often don't state if a function's going to uh, access the disk or not. You just don't know, which is important. Uh, closures and anonymous functions you don't have in C, so that makes writing such evented code uh, difficult. <clears throat> and things like libmysql client don't support asynchronous queries. I think they actually might do asynchronous queries, but not asynchronous connections. Uh, and asynchronous DNS resolution is, is really difficult to find. So um, there are certain solutions. Uh, you might have heard of Event Machine or Python's Twisted, or if you come from Perl, any event. Uh, these are libraries that provide such an event loop with non-blocking sockets. And it is fairly easy to use them to create efficient servers. But I think that users are, are kind of confused as how to use this. If you're using Ruby, there's all of these libraries available. And you have Event Machine in here, and you want to know, how do I use these other ones? And usually the answer to that is you can't, because the MySQL library for Ruby blocks on everything. So you can't just throw that into an event loop. But people don't know that. And so users really still require some knowledge of event loops or non-blocking I.O., which almost nobody has. And so it doesn't abstract the problem very well. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, luckily, JavaScript was, was designed in such a way that, that it was built for an event loop. The browser side JavaScript that you have is an event loop. You create a button. Somebody clicks it, you get an on-click callback. This is exactly what one needs to, to do event loop stuff. <clears throat> so yeah, it has anonymous functions and closures. When you're on the browser, you only get one callback at a time. You're not getting multiple callbacks, and you don't need to lock variables. And the I.O. is, is just done through those callbacks. <clears throat> so I think everybody in this room who is familiar with Java, uh, JavaScript uh, is already kind of prepared for writing evented servers. You don't, you, you don't really need to know that much more. <clears throat> so, right, so that was a long motivation. So uh, what I want to make is uh, a non-blocking infrastructure so that you can make very highly concurrent servers and you don't need to know about it. We're going to abstract all of the difficult non-blocking event loop. You don't need to know about that. It's just going to be callbacks. So, uh, right. so, uh, so let me just give some design goals, and then I'll, I'll give some actual practical examples of how to build a server. 
So first of all, no function should perform I.O. Uh, to receive disk or network uh, information from, uh, or from another process, uh, you have to have some sort of callback. So you can never have that sort of function that makes some query that returns something. That's not allowed. Uh, it should be low level. So um, I want everything to be able to stream in and out. Uh, you never, I should never force the user to buffer data. Uh, and if you're familiar with like Ruby on Rails or something, a lot of places force you to buffer data in one way or another. Um, I don't want to make those choices for you. It's low level. People can build on top of that. So if they want to buffer their data, then they can do that. But at my level, at the node level, it should not make any sort of decisions like that. <clears throat> and similarly, uh, I shouldn't remove uh, any functionality at the POSIX layer. So for example, have closed TCP connections. Everybody's shrugging. But there, there's good stuff to be had that everybody ignores. Um, and so I should also have like some built-in support. You don't want to write everything. I want, you to, I want it to be low level, but I think TCP and DNS and HTTP are infrastructural protocols. They're very important, and so there should be very good support for them in such a system. <clears throat> and uh, in particular with, with uh, HTTP, it should, uh, it's going to have many features. So we're going to have chunked requests, chunked responses, I'm going to have keep alive, and importantly, it should be, you should be able to get a request and respond to it at will. So you should be able to hang requests. And this is what you need for comet style applications. If you want to do a long poll, then you have to hang that request and wait till you have something to tell the user. <clears throat> and finally, the, the API needs to be familiar. So um, if I'm going to have a timer, I'm going to call it set timeout. It's going to, it should look like browser JavaScript. And where it's not browser JavaScript, where I'm talking about POSIX stuff, then it should use the POSIX names. That is, I don't want to reinvent what people are doing. I just kind of want to present an idealized version of that. And then finally, it should be platform independent. Uh, at the moment, I don't compile on Windows, but there's no reason I can't, and I hope to soon. <clears throat> OK, so now, now some actual examples. Um, so Node is, you have to compile it, so you have to download it. Um, so there's no binaries, is what I want to say. And you, there's no real dependencies other than Python. So it should be fairly easy to, to build. It's not, it's not very difficult, or at least it should not be. OK, so here's, here's your first example. Um, this program is going to output hello after having waited two seconds. Um, so first, first we uh, require the sys module, which we need to output some, some data. This is the common JS require, uses the semantics defined by common JS. Um, then we set a timeout for 2,000 milliseconds. <clears throat> Importantly, the callback inside is not done right now. First, we print hello, which comes after that. Two seconds later, world is printed out. So uh, node after the world is printed out, node exits. So uh, that's kind of important. When there's nothing else to do on the event loop, if there's no more timers, then it exits. It's the end of the process. OK, so, so here's what you would do. You would put it into a file called hello world.js and then run it with the node program. And you get hello. Two seconds later, world, and the process exits. OK. <clears throat> So now we're going to change the hello world program. Um, and what we'll do this time is, is we're going to go in a loop. So we're going to use the, the uh, set um, interval function. And we're going to loop forever and print out a message. 
And then what we want when the user kills it, when they hit control C, uh, that it prints out a message and then exits. And this is to demonstrate uh, the special process object in Node and the, um, how you set a signal handler uh, the, for the interrupt signal, the sigint. OK, so, so again, we, we do the require. We just need one function, so let's just pull it out into a variable. Uh, in the next three lines, we set up the interval, which calls that callback every 500 milliseconds. Um, right, and then the last couple lines, we're setting up a, a signal handler. Um, so you do this by calling this add listener function, which is, uh, should be fairly familiar if you're used to the DOM. Um, then you, put, you, you print out goodbye and then uh, you, you exit the process. <clears throat> so this, this process object um, emits events uh, when it receives a signal. So it emits the sig int event. Um, there, it would be the same for any other uh, signal that, that the process might get. <clears throat> um, so, so this is like the dome. You just add a listener to catch what the process is doing. Uh, there's a couple of other things on the process, like the PID, the program arguments, the environment, current working directory, memory usage, useful things. So uh, the, the way that process emits these events is, is pretty typical for Node. Um, so many objects emit events. Uh, it's kind of the, the fundamental paradigm in, in, in Node. Um, so, like, for example, a TCP server would emit a connection event every time somebody connects. And, like, if you have somebody's doing an HTTP upload, it would emit, the request object would emit a, a body event each time you get a packet of that upload. So somebody's uploading a stream, uh, a movie or so to your server, and you get body, body, body. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, all objects that emit events are, are instances of, of the event emitter class. <clears throat> okay, so, so here's, here's the first TCP server example. So we're going to make a TCP server. It's going to listen on port 8000. And then when somebody connects, we're going to send the, the peer a message. We're going to say hello, and then we're going to close the connection. So a very simple TCP server. So we have to require the TCP module. That's what we do in the first line. And then we create a server object, S. And we, that's a TCP server. And then we, we add a listener for the connection event. And we get this object C from, from the connection event. That's, that's our connection. <clears throat> um, we send it hello. We close. And then finally, we, we have to start it listening on port 8000. So if, if we tried that, then uh, we would uh, start the, we would put that code into server.js, and you can tell that to localhost at port 8000, and you get hello, and then the, the, the server closes the connection. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we can simplify this a little bit. So the, the connection listener does it, you don't need to call this add listener, you can just pass it to the constructor. And so, so we can simplify this program into just a couple lines by, by doing this. So file I.O. in, in Node is non-blocking. Uh, this is something that's usually very hard to do. In Node, it's quite hard not to do. It's a bit the opposite, um, which is good. I mean, the, the way that you should be doing things should be easy, and the way you shouldn't be doing things should be difficult. OK, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the last time somebody modified EDC password. So first, we require the POSIX module, which has all of our file I.O. operations. And we pull out the stat function. And we require our, our uh, puts function, get that from the sys module. And uh, then we call stat on, on EDC password, and it returns a promise. Um, 
which I'll talk more about. Uh, and then we add a callback to the promise, which gets called when, when the stat operation was complete. <clears throat> and then finally we print out the, the modified time. So the, these, these promise objects are pretty common. Um, all the file operations return a promise. And so a promise is, is an event emitter which, which emits a success or an error event. So if you do some file operation, you don't want to block because that's going to be a long time. You can't just shut down your server while you spin the disk. So you send off this request to the, to the disk. Okay, get, tell me what time that, that file was modified. I'm going to go do other things. And then eventually it comes back and it says, success, I got the answer for you, here it is. Or error. So the, the promise.add callback was, was just API sugar for, for promise.add uh, listener for success. Okay, so we're getting progressively more complicated. Um, now we're going to do an HTTP server. Uh, we have to require the, the HTTP module, and we create a HTTP server object. And the callback for this, which is called on each request, gives you a request object and a response object. Um, so then we send the, the header, the, the 200 success code, and content type, text plane, and we send body, hello, uh, send body world, and then we finish the response. This is slightly more complicated than um, if you were at the Narwhal talk before. Uh, Tom promotes the, the JSGI uh, specification. This is more complicated than that, but it's, it's for a good reason. Uh, JSGI uh, requires you to uh, rack to, it's, it's the same thing. You have a function, and then you return the result. So all the processing happens in a single function, which, as I said at the beginning, is something we want to avoid. If you have to connect to the database, then you don't want to, you don't want to have to respond in one function. Now, I, I think that there's uh, some ways to do that with, with JSGI, but I like this. I think it's, it's simple enough. So let's, let's uh, try this out. So we put the, the code into HTTP server.js. We run curl on it, and we get hello world. OK, now slightly more complicated. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to have a HTTP server, which outputs hello world. But instead of outputting it all at once, it's going to output hello and then it's going to output world two seconds later. So what we do is we put a set timeout in there. So we wait for 2,000 milliseconds in the, the request callback. Um, so you might wonder, like, OK, who cares? Why would anybody want to do this? But this is important, because while the server doesn't shut down when, when the set timeout is called, it doesn't say set timeout. It's not a sleep. You're not sleeping for two seconds and not doing anything else. You're serving requests. So here's a request, here's a request, here's a request. And then suddenly, OK, that one's done, that one's done, that one's done. This is the exact behavior that you need for Comet-style applications. If you need to do a long pull, you have to be able to hang requests in an efficient way. And this demonstrates how you can do that. This isn't the right way to do a long pull thing, but it demonstrates that you can hang requests. <clears throat> so uh, let's try it out. We put it into a file, HTTP server 2, call it with node, run curl, we get hello, two seconds later, we get world, a streaming web server. OK, we can also use, uh, we can also call programs with node, one would hope. Uh, so we can do that with the sys.exe command. Um, of course, this also returns a promise because it's something that doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen in memory. But you know, if you do ls slash, that might have to spin the disk. And so there's some time that happens between 
the time that that starts and the time that that finishes. So we have to have a callback. So we, we add a callback to the promise object, which is returned from sys.exe, and then we output the, the, the output. OK, so, but I told you before that I, I never would force people to buffer data, and that just buffered the data. So there's also a lower level way to call subprocess, to, call, to make a child process, where uh, you can stream the data through, through the standard I.O. So you can stream that if, if you're, you ls on a huge directory. You don't want to buffer all of that data in memory. You want to stream it to, to, the, to, the, to the parent process and parse it and handle it, do whatever with it, but hopefully not buffer it. So this is a simple form of, of inner process communication. <clears throat> so uh, this is an example of that, where we're going to launch the cat program, uh, like the Unix cat program, which whatever you, you send to it, it just sends the same thing back. And so we create the child process in line three. <clears throat> we add a listener for output. So every time that there's some output, it calls that, that callback. And then in the last couple lines, we, we write data to the cat process. And so that's sending that hello world in line 11 and 12 to the standard in of the cat process. And then finally, we call close, which closes the standard in of the cat process and uh, cat terminates when its standard in is, is complete. OK. So we can, we can create sub-processes. We can create uh, child processes and stream data in and out of, out of them. OK, so, so now I have a demo for you. Um, I wrote an IRC server in Node, uh, just a, a hack, really. Um, but just to demonstrate uh, what you can do. So uh, maybe this will work, maybe this won't work, but let's, let's try to go to irc.nodejs.org and go on to the node.js channel. OK, so, so I have my, my terminal here. I'm actually logged into the server. So what, first of all, I'm going to connect to the server. Hopefully, it's still running and it hasn't crashed. OK, so, so now I'm connected. And I, I will join the, the Node.js channel. OK, so, so if, if people uh, did that, you can see people talking. So, so this, this IRC server is, is uh, running on Node. Um, this is an IRC client, of course. Uh, what I want to do is um, actually show. <laughs> yes. I, wanna, I also have a repo library, a read eval print loop. And so since we have an event loop, we can add all sorts of I.O. to this. This is one process, but we can add a REPL to it without thinking about it. Because what we do is we do all the, on our event loop, we, we do all the connections, we send all the messages, we come back, and then we can do the REPL things. If we wanted to add an HTTP server to that, that would also be possible, all in the same process, just by going around the event loop. And since nothing blocks, we can just add as much I.O. as we want to. <clears throat> so I, I show you the REPL now. OK, so um, it's running on screen. So I'm just going to open the screen. Uh, 
Ah, there it is. Okay, so, so this is the IRCD uh, repo thing. And so what I can do is, is I have total control over uh, the IRC server. So for example, I can um, kill some of these users off. Yay. Okay, I, I have full control. I can also make people like say things. Anyway, the point is we, we have a we have a repo to to the the uh, IRC server, um, and of course, if I just control C it, then everybody will go away, and they're offline now because the IRC server is gone. And if I turn it back on, then it's just there. Okay, so so that's my my demo. Um, Um, yeah, so so uh, check out the the code if you want. It's it's just 400 lines or so. Uh, I I think uh, this demonstrates that Node abstracts the real problem of writing an IRC server away, because if you look at the code of that, it's just okay. Somebody connects. Okay, I have a list of users. Okay, I send this user that message. It's it's really quite easy to follow, in my humble opinion. Um, Whereas if you try to sit down and write an IRC server, say, in Ruby, I think you'll find it very difficult. OK, I guess you can use Event Machine, and you might find it OK. But I think that, that, that this really abstracts the, 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 the problem of, of writing a, a concurrent server. So if you want to throw together, say, a message queue daemon, start up Node, type out 100 lines of JavaScript, and there's your, your message queue daemon that, that does whatever specific thing that you need it to do. OK, so, so just briefly, uh, I, I talk about the internal design of Node. So Node is not some big monolithic app. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of C libraries that uh, are kind of uh, hacked together in various ways. So the V8 is not a little C library. It's a huge C library. Um, that's by Google, of course. Um, the libev event loop and libeio uh, thread pool are, are really nice little libraries, uh, and they're both written by Mark Lehman. Uh, there's a HTTP parser, which is uh, quite advanced. It could do all sorts of streaming sort of things. Uh, that's by me. And a, a socket library by me, too. And then uh, a U. UDNS is, is a DNS resolver, which is important. <clears throat> so the way that I do this is uh, there's a lot of system calls that you might do. If you have to access the file system, those system calls, those POSIX system calls can block. And so what I do is I have a thread pool. 
underneath everything. And I say, okay, I want to uh, do this system call. I want to uh, read a directory. I pack it up, and then I send it off to the thread pool. It does stuff, and then it comes back. Um, signal handlers uh, are usually asynchronous from the rest of your execution stack. Um, and this, this thread pool thing, these things are kind of asynchronous from the main Node.js event loop. And so they have to notify, they have to be marshaled back into the main event loop. You have to say, OK, wait your turn. All right, now we can process the signal handler. You can't just do it immediately. When the result comes from the event loop, you can't just say, Psh, stop everything. We're going to do this. You have to say, OK, all right, now we can process you. And we, I do this by, by using a pipe from the thread pool in and from uh, signal handlers in. And you can select on that pipe. Uh, another thing that I did is I'm worried about what happens if you pipe a huge file into Node. Um, so say this, this file is 200 megabytes and uh, has a list of domain names, and you want to look them all up. So each line is a domain name, and you want to do DNS resolution on them. But you can't block the DNS resolution, or else it's going to be really slow. What you want to do is read it in, stream it into your node process, read the lines, do the DNS lookups, and this should all be on the same event loop. So uh, the problem is, is that in Unix, or in any POSIX uh, system, the standard ed file descriptor is going to refer to a file. And uh, you can't select on files. You can't add them to your event loop. And you can't just read from them, because that's going to block. So what you do is you create a pumping thread, and you have a pipe. And so you do these blocking reads from the file, pump them into the pipe, which goes into the main application. And in this way, you can stream data into the, the server in a non-blocking way with just one extra thread. These are the sort of things that you might have to do, know about, if you were going to write this yourself. You don't have to do that. It's, under the, it's down below the, the API that the, the users deal with. Uh, if you're interested, look in the source directory at, at the coupling. OK, so, so what's next? Uh, I have to fix some, some API issues. There's various things that are very kind of ugly. Um, <clears throat> I want to have more modularity. I want to have uh, break up the libraries into DLLs so that the, the core node process is very small, and that if you need the HTTP server, you would load a DLL to, to uh, some shared object to, um, to get the HTTP parser, for example. Um, I'm going to include some libraries for like MySQL and Postgres into the core distribution. I need to improve performance. Um, that's always an issue. Uh, there's there's a, some low-hanging fruit that I know about that we can that we can pick and make it faster. TLS support is on its way, and then finally, I would like to do some sort of web worker like thing, which would probably just extend the, the child process object so that you can create processes and kind of do IPC between them in a, in a nice way. <clears throat> so uh, right now, the version is 0 0.1.17. Um, I will release 0 0.2, which will be kind of the first version that I would hope that other people would use. At the moment, I think it's a bit hacky, and if you're experimental, then please use it. Um, but if not, then wait for 0 0.2. And uh, I think that will be good, because I will freeze the API, or at least some of it. And so you can kind of build on it with some confidence that I won't change it out from under new. <clears throat> OK, so uh, yes, any questions? So the, the question is, uh, 
if like if you make changes to the source file, will it will it load in those changes? Uh, no, but uh, Felix and I have been hacking on this a bit uh, this weekend. It's something I'd like to add. Yes. So the question is, what do I do with blocking writes? When you have a, a socket, uh, there's a write buffer in the kernel, and you can only write so much data to the write buffer before it gets filled up. The kernel can't push out all the data to the network as fast as it wants to. There's some buffer that, that can possibly fill up. So if you're streaming a file out of the socket to somewhere else, then that can block. In Node, it doesn't block. Uh, it buffers the data. It will allocate data internally if you do that. Um, and what you could do is get a callback when that buffer, when the kernel buffer drains. So what you can do if you want to stream a, a file to somebody, you start sending it, and then you send it, say, uh, a megabyte, which may fill up the buffer, may not fill up the buffer. And then you wait till it drains. And then you send another megabyte. And so in this way, you can stream data the, the write buffer will never fill up. What, what will happen is I'll uh, allocate memory so in, in user space. So, so writes don't block. So the question is, what, what is my stance on CommonJS? Uh, so CommonJS, I think, uh, has a lot of good proposals. So the module system I'm using, uh, there's a binary pr proposal, and there's a package proposal, which, which look very good. Um, at the moment, CommonJS has only ratified, I think, the, the module proposal and the assert, uh, this testing library proposal. So, it doesn't define things like I.O. Uh, so I think those discussions will be ongoing. I think there's some people who want it more in a blocking state. I want it more in a vented state. And so we'll fight it out over the next couple months or so. Yes? Uh, a little bit. I, I would like to have more money for it. it uh, <laughs> writing your own open source project uh, requires a lot of effort, and uh, yeah, it needs funding. Yes? 